welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. I'm going to get down on my knees and pray. I need God and you do too. So stand to your feet. Let's put our hearts before the Lord. Let's let him talk to us tonight. Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus, giving you all praise, all glory, and all honor. We thank you, Father, that we haven't come into the house of God to hear from a man or a woman. We haven't come to hear from an old man or a young man or a tall man or a short man or a white man or a black man or a brown man. We haven't come. No, we've come to hear from the teacher of the church who is the Holy Spirit. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us, encourage us, guide us, guard us, direct us, and motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, glory, and all the honor. How good it is to be in your house at this time, this day. Here's our hearts. Fill it with your way and your will, and we'll give you the praise. Now, Lord, as you bless us, we would ask that you bless all the churches in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't want you just to bless us. We want you to bless all the churches that are preaching the gospel because they're our brothers and they're our sisters, and we just love them, Lord. At no time do we think of ourselves as better or greater than them, but we actually, Lord, see ourselves as co-laborers, workers together in one field, building one kingdom, and that's yours. And we give you the praise in Jesus' mighty name with a great big shout. We all say, Amen. Amen. Go ahead and take your seat. Get your Bible. Go with me to James' first chapter. I want to read to you a verse, and then I want to come back and explain the title. And then I want to talk to you about something that God laid on my heart this morning. And I've been uh, thinking about it for about two weeks, at least a part of it. And uh, just meditating a part of it that's just, I thought that's what I was going to share, but it only becomes a very small fraction of what I'm going to be sharing tonight. James first chapter, verse number six, says it like this. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man and unstable in all of his ways. I remember when I first read this, it kind of bothered me because at times I'm double-minded. At times I think of one way and I think I'm doing pretty good and all of a sudden my mind changes to other things and other ways and I see things differently and I change and then I change back and then I'm back and forth and we've probably all been there. But I, I, I found it offensive because God makes a statement here that is an amazing statement. He says somebody who, listen to this, asks in faith but is doubting, he says in verse number six, doubts is like the wave of the sea is tossed to and fro by the wind. In other words, he, he's not reliable at all. But verse number seven, so let the man suppose that he receives nothing. He's not going to get anything from God at all. And then in verse number eight, he makes a statement that's offensive to me. He says it's unstable in all of his ways. I didn't think I was unstable in all of my ways because I was double-minded. But if God says that's what a double-minded man is, I've got to get in line with the things of God. And stop going from here to there, staying, I need to stay the course and keep on going straight. I don't need to be flipping around in my faith. I don't need to be one day in faith and the next day out of faith and one day wondering where God's at. If I'm going to do something in faith, I need to stay in there in faith. Or God sees me as an unstable person and I'm never going to get anything from God according to what he says. And so a lot of times we think we just get away with stuff when in fact we're burying ourselves by being unstable, by being double-minded. By one day being in faith and some little problem pressure comes our way and then we're out of faith again and we start living life differently than what we're believing God for. Every single one of us ought to be in faith about something. If you're born of the Spirit of God, there's a lot of things to put your faith on. Every single person in here that's born of the Spirit of God, you ought to have your faith about something going on in your life. You ought to have faith about your children or faith about your marriage faith about your business or faith about your finances. I mean, what makes you think that you're where you're at today and you can't go any further than where you're at today? 
What makes you think possibly that there couldn't be some kind of a revival in your family that would take your family and sweep through just because they seem to be a certain way? Do you know that God is a great God could do great and mighty marvelous things? We ought to believe God for great and mighty marvelous things. Every day of our life, we ought to be people in faith. And I really believe the job of the devil is to get us to be double-minded so that we are unstable in all of our ways. And then God has got to keep his word. You know what his word says? That don't think for a moment you're going to get anything, the old King James says. And I want you to know something. When you are double-minded, you're really not in faith. So all you have to do is the devil can allow you to get into faith and then cause problems and pressures, put tests on your faith to the place where he runs you off, you become double-minded, and you never get anything from God because he will keep his word. He won't give it to you if you're not going to stay in there. And I found it out the hard way and the, and the more difficult way that if I'm going to be a person of faith and believe God, because there's no other way to please God but by faith, and therefore if I'm going to please God and I'm going to walk in faith and believe God for great, mighty, marvelous things, I've got to hang in there no matter if there's pressure, trials, tribulations against my faith or not. And I find that oftentimes I'm not alone in this and most of the body of Christ, most of the church today finds themselves in a place of wondering why they're not getting anything from God. One day they're in, one day they're out. One day they're up, one day they're down. And you're double-minded. And when you're double-minded, the Bible says it's crazy. You're unstable, not in a few ways, but in all of your ways. And therefore, that's a bizarre, rude statement, but God's in your face about that. And all of us need to probably learn something. In today's message, it's called the testing of our faith. The testing of our faith. Our faith, if you're going to be believing God for something, is going to be tested along the way before it comes to pass. Don't you wish you could just say, well, today I'm in faith and I'm going to get the results of my faith today. Have you ever noticed I could be in faith and it takes a long time for that to happen? I really want it, and I want it right now. I want to be just like if I drive up to a Taco Bell, give me 12 of those suckers for 10 bucks, man. And I want them right now, and I want them in three minutes, and I want to drive out of the place, and I want a free Coke on top of it. But with God, it doesn't work that way. With God, let me tell you something, oftentimes you're going to have to wait. And you're going to have to endure, and you're going to have to exercise something that we all really hate called patience. And we're not any one of us in here immune to the fact that, guess what, we can be in faith. We don't get anything if we don't hang in there. Is anybody listening? So today, the testing of our faith. I find out there are some things as I studied and meditated and over the years looking at the Word of God, some things I want to share with you by the Spirit of God tonight that will help you in your faith to hang in and stay in there in your faith. So we're going to talk about the testing of our faith happens, and then it's when something takes place. Number one, the testing of our faith happens when the road is hard. When times are difficult and situations are hard, we start to question God, we start to doubt God. Like, for an example, we are in there believing God for some supernatural thing, and it doesn't come to pass right away. So the first thing we start to do, man, there's pressures, there's trials. The road is difficult, and we start to doubt, God, are you even in this? Do you even care? Do you want me to, uh, have I done something wrong? What's going on? Why isn't this happening to me? And I want you to know something. Your faith will be tested every time when the road is tough. Let me give you an illustration of that. Recently, I was on vacation with Pastor Luke and Pastor Dan. Uh, you call them Pastor Luke and Pastor Dan. I call them sons. And so all the whole family, we had 15 people in one condominium. I am a better man of God than you know. For one week. Oh my goodness, that was the noisiest place I had ever been in. Day and night. Then Mama and I got alone and all we did was fight. Just the two of us, you know what I mean? It should have been bad, but it wasn't. It was like, ugh, we're so wound up from the grandkids. We had 15 people in one condominium. It was amazing. So one day, we're up at Mammoth Lakes, and one of, uh, Luke says, let's go fishing, fly fishing on the upper lakes. And I said, okay, let's go. Where is it? He said, well, you know, Dad, it's uh, 11,000 feet high. 
and you've got to walk to it. Now, I'm not kind of like hardly wait to do that at my age. It wasn't like I was saying, wow, that looks like something I've been dreaming about while I was taking my afternoon nap. You know, uh, so uh, it was like, <laughs> you know, okay. But, I, you know, there was something on the inside. He says, now, Dad, we're going to drive up to about 10,000 feet. And then we're going to walk another 1,000 feet. It's pretty high. It's maybe a mile or so. And I have Pastor Dan with us. He's got his fly fishing rod. And I've got mine. I've got one of my grandsons, James, with us. And, um, and, and myself. And we all start to go up this mountain. The road is rough. It's really tough, 10,000, 10,001, 10,002, 10,003. And, I'm, you know, there's not a lot of air up there. And these guys, of course, are young, and they're just like going bopping up the hill, you know, <laughs> having a great time. And the old man is going behind, you know. And, I'm, I, and, and so, you know, I, I want you to know something. If I had kept my eyes on the hard road, I'd have never made it to the lake. And I really learned a lesson See, I didn't look at all the rocks and boulders I was climbing over, didn't listen to the dust and breathe the dust, didn't listen to the stupid bees that were trying to get in my ears, didn't listen to all that stuff. All I could see was a mountain lake catching trout on a fly rod. And, of course, being the old man that made it. And I kept my eyes on the vision of the results and not often on the hard road. And even though they would go up really fast, and then they'd lean against a rock and wait for me, and they're talking, and I'm drugging up, but I got to the rock where they were sitting, then they do what? Jump up, and they'd been rested, so they go really fast again, and they wait up there, and I'm, I never got to rest. <laughs> but I got good news. The old man made it, man. But see, here's the principle. Here's the point. The point being is this. I would have never made it if I'd kept my eyes on the road. The road to where you want to go, you got to get it in your mind, is going to be tough. And if you let a hard, tough road stop you, you will never make it in life. And that's what God tries to tell us all through the scriptures. Let me just take you, if I may, to a lady who is amazing to me, if I may take you to Mark, the seventh chapter. Are you all right with me tonight? And Mark, we're talking about the rough road, the things that would hinder, the things that would test your faith. And Mark, and we're talking about this rough road, how to deal with it. Now watch this. This is a lady. She's approached uh, uh, Jesus. She's got a demon-possessed daughter. I mean, she's just not a, a, a Jew. She's a Gentile. And she's having a difficult life. Can you imagine having a, a daughter that is demon-possessed in those days. And, you know, she's alone. I don't know if she's unmarried or anything like that, but she approaches Jesus. Now, you and I have a 20th century <coughs> view of Jesus. We see him as something wonderful and kind and sweet and gentle. But, you know, if you read the scripture, he is blunt and in your face and says it like it is. So this lady comes up, and she really needs help from Jesus. And he makes the hardest statement I have ever heard. I mean, if he had made this statement to me, I'd have probably slapped him in the face. I'd have probably died for that, and lightning would have hit me, but I mean, it just really bugs me. Okay, let me read it to you, starting in verse number 25 of the 7th chapter of Mark. Remember, we're talking about a hard road. If you don't go through the hard road, you're never going to get to where you need to be. You'll start doubting. Are there hard roads on the way to completion of your faith? Absolutely, number one. Now watch this. For a woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit, heard about him, speaking of notice capitulation of the word him, speaking about Jesus, and she came and she fell at his feet. I mean, what a humble position to fall at his feet. Stop thinking about it for a moment. She finds her way and she falls at his feet. I mean, that's a low begging position. Now watch this. And the woman was a Greek. A Syrophoenician by birth. And she kept asking him, and notice this, she didn't just ask him once. He's obviously ignored her a number of times. Some of you don't understand this. Jesus came, if he had come for the Gentiles, he would have, he came for everybody on the earth. But you have to understand that his ministry is for the Jews. 
if it wasn't for the Jews that he was ministering to, the Jews would never have anything to do with him if he had something to do with the Gentiles. So he knew the Gentiles were going to be reached through his love and his ministry and his thing. But in order for that to happen, he didn't want to cut off the Jews, okay? So he's ignoring her. Now watch this. So she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And Jesus said to her, let the children be filled first, speaking of the Jewish culture. Watch this. For it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to little dogs. I mean, that is like the hardest road you're ever going to be at. That's like the toughest statement. She was just called by Jesus a little dog. And so was her daughter. That is a horrible expression. All, if you understand the scripture, you understand where he's coming from, you understand why he did it and what he did it for, then it's not a problem. Then you can understand it clearly why that's taken place. So I want to emphasize that to you. But I'm not teaching that tonight. I'm saying here's a hard road for this woman. At that very moment, if he had said that to me, I'd have said, who do you think you are? Who? I mean, I come begging at your feet. Because I know you cast a a devil out of my daughter. And you call me and my daughter a dog? And you think we're dogs? Let me tell you something. In order for you to accomplish what it is that you have before you, you're going to have to deal with the hard roads. That's a hard road she's on right now. She could get ticked off like I would have gotten ticked off. She could have actually insulted him. She could have said something horrible back to him. But she needed results. Listen to me, my friends. You need results. And sometimes you're going to have to swallow your pride, get and stay on that hard road until you get the results. Because it's not about putting somebody down. It's not about correcting somebody. It's about, at the end of life, getting the results that you need. And a hard road to get those results. She is in the midst of it right now. So she makes this statement, first story 28. And she answers and said, yes, Lord, even the little dogs under the table eat from the children's crumbs. Man, that shocked him. And he makes this statement in verse 29. He says, and then she said to her, for this saying, for this saying, for this saying, in other words, because of what you just said, wow, lady, your daughter's healed. Go. And the demon's gone. She had to stay through the rough road of that insult. You're going to have to stay through the rough roads of life that are going to come at you to try to knock you off your faith so you never get your results because if you're a double-minded man, you're unstable in all of your ways and you cannot get anything from God. That's number one. There are rough roads along the way. Are you listening to me? Number two, let's take a look at something else because we're talking about the testing of our faith happens, number two, when there is a lack of logic. We're always looking for logical answers to things. I can't figure it out. It doesn't make sense to me. Therefore, you know we are such a logical society. We're a group of people. If we can't figure out how two plus two makes four, then we give up. Can I tell you something about God? If you you might as well stop coming to church if you're looking for logic. There is nothing logical about the cross and the crucifixion and the resurrection and the empowering of the Holy Spirit and eternal life. There is, it is not natural. It is not logical. It is supernatural. And blessed are those that have not seen but still believe. See, it's a supernatural thing. And we want logic. We want two plus two is... Don't even want two plus two is six or eight or five. We want four. If it doesn't work, but with God, nothing is, adds up the way you think it ought to add up. Nothing happens the way you think it. Get the picture. It just is not going to happen that way. I was reading all the last couple of weeks. I don't know why. I've just been drawn by the Holy Spirit in the book of Job. I thought I had the book of Job like totally figured out after 35 years of being a theologian. And I thought, man, I, you know, I, I write commentaries on Job. And I've just been spending hours just meditating Job. 
I mean, it's just like the first chapter and the second, first part of the second chapter. It's really wild. God has this like gathering together of the angels. And here comes Satan. The Bible says that Satan comes. I mean, somebody says, well, I don't believe in the devil. Guess what? You ought to read your Bible. God does. And Satan comes, and he's in this meeting with God. And God looks at Satan. He says, you know, have you considered my servant Job, who is upright? You know, and Satan knows him. God knows him. Just the fact that all people upon the planet, God knows who you are. Satan knows who you are. You know, and he says, have you considered my servant Job? And, and, and Satan says to God, hey, let me tell you something. Uh, there's nothing to consider. You put a hedge about him. He's a righteous man. You're not going to take it down. But if you curse him and you take away his blessings, he'll curse you to his face. And so all of a sudden, you know, he says, well, wait a minute. All that he has is in your power, Satan. So Satan immediately, bang, man, he goes after Job, tears his family apart, kills his kids, robs his finances, everything is gone, but Job holds on to his integrity. It's like a most amazing story. And then you'll find in chapter number two, he goes back to another meeting with God, Satan. Where have you been? He says, I've been going to and fro, walking upon the planet. Ever wonder why he goes to and fro and walks upon the planet? He's looking for people with weak faith. He's working, looking for people who compromise. Why? Because he wants to tear them apart. But he couldn't get to Job until God said, go ahead and do it. And you say, why would God say, go ahead and do it? Because Job's life is something for you and I to understand so that we know that if he made it, we can make it. And that's what this is all about. And there's nothing logical about Job. Here's this righteous, upright man. The Bible makes it very clear that he never lost his integrity. And in the first couple of chapters, here he is, he's lost everything. He even, listen to this, his life is so bad that he curses the day that he was born. He's got boils, he's got everything, his life is on the stake. He, the only one that doesn't die is his wife. She comes to him and says, curse God and die. I would have said, God, why'd you take my kids? Take her. She lives, you know what I'm saying? And so, and, and for the next like 24 chapters is Job's friends all coming in and telling him. You know, Job's friends are interesting. I read through it and studied it all out. They say a lot of truth and a lot of lies. Can I tell you something? When you have truth mixed with lies, all you have is a lie. Because truth is pure. Truth is holy. Truth is righteous. There is no lie. There is no shadow of turning inside truth. So if you take truth, and it sounds good, but you mix it with a lie, you got a lie. Are you following me? And for all these chapters, here's Job's friends coming along, and they're telling him all this kind of stuff. And then the most interesting thing happens. I think it's about chapter number 28. God starts to speak to Job. I never saw this before. And God starts to say, see, Job, because of his friends, started getting weak in his faith. He started to become double-minded, unstable in his ways. He wasn't saying anything with his mouth. He hadn't cursed God or anything like that. But because of all the influence, have you ever had influence from other people and all of a sudden your faith starts to get weak? Let me tell you something. Why? Because they're looking at the logic and here we're saying, if it's not logical, it doesn't work, it isn't going to work. But this is a supernatural content, supernatural world we're talking about. So here's Job, he starts to get a little weary in his faith. And he starts to, in his questioning of God, how come this is happening to me? He didn't come quite out and say that, but that's really what it says. And then God, bang, comes in the 28th chapter. And he starts to speak to Job for the next four chapters he asked Job, I stopped counting at 70, asked Job 70 questions. Did you know that nobody in the entire Bible was ever asked by God 70 questions? Four chapters of 70 questions. Here's the kind of question. Where were you when I put up the stars? Where were you when I held back? the? Who do you think you are that you can't even measure the, and yet you question me about what happened to you? 
You're questioning me? Let me tell you something. If you learn anything from the book of Job, don't question God. God's in control. And what may be happening to you may be happening to you, and it may not be logical, but if you hold on to it to the end, like Job, God will bless you. Come on, somebody. So it's not always logical. In fact, look at the book of John while you're there in the New Testament, John the ninth chapter. In John the ninth chapter, it says this, and now as Jesus passed by, take a look, if you will, in verse number one. John the ninth chapter. Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned that the man's, his parents, or was he born blind? And Jesus answered, neither the man nor the parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. Now, can I just say something? They're looking for the logical. They didn't get it. Who sinned? The father? Who sinned? The kid? What's that all about? Why did he get to where he's at? Oftentimes in your life, nothing is logical. Hold on to faith. Hold on to God. It's not logical what you're doing. Don't listen to your friends. Keep on going with God. And may I say this to you, like Job, you will get blessed at the end. Because listen to this, when you become double-minded, you don't get anything. Is anybody listening? So today we're talking about some things that are really important, the testing of your faith. I want you not to be double-minded. I want you to keep on going. I want you to be blessed. I don't want you to fall away. We're talking about a rough road will hinder or test your faith. Just absolutely understand that everybody has a rough road. Number two, understand that nothing is logical. Stop looking for the logic and why things happen. They just happen and you go right through them. You come out on the other side, you say, okay, I've still got God, I've still got life, I've still got breath, and God's going to do a great, mighty, marvelous thing. I do not understand why, but I don't need to question God. He's the God that put the stars in the sky. Come on, somebody. We're, We're talking about a wonderful subject. That testing of our faith happens, and here's number three, when you have no idea how. All of a sudden, when you don't know how it's going to work, it doesn't even calculate inside. You don't know how. You know, I'm always not only trying to figure out an answer. I love what Dr. Gilfillan said to me one time. He said, you can think of 1,000 ways that God could do something that you're believing him for, but assuredly it'll be the 1,000 one way, the one way you never believed that he would do it. That's how God is. I don't know how things work. Somebody asked me the other day, called me on the phone on the other side of the world, said, I want to know something. I've got a few minutes to talk to you, and I'm a pastor. I want to know how you built such a big church. And I said, I have no idea you wasted your money. (laughs) I don't know how anything works. You understand this is about God. And I don't understand anything about God. Have you ever heard a preacher ever tell you that before? Every preacher always tries to pretend like they got it all. They're so super spiritual. Let me tell you the truth. Don't don't know nothing. And the more you know, the less you know. And somebody ought to be honest with you about it. He's a big, great, marvelous God who does things beyond my understanding. And I don't know how it's going to work, but it's going to work. I don't know how you're going to make it, but if you hang in there, you'll make it. I don't know how you're going to produce, but if you hang in there, you'll produce. I don't know how it's going to happen, but I know this. If you hang in there, it'll happen. That's what it's all about. Someone said, well, how how did you do it? I, I said, I just outlasted everybody. Everybody else's road got too rough. I didn't know any other place to go. Everybody else had logic working for them. I I have no logic at all. I'm the dumbest guy in town. God, you said it, I believe it. I'm following you. That's it. Settled. Done deal. That's how it works. I love what it says in Hebrews, the 11th chapter, verse number 8. I'll just pop it up for you. Ready? Hebrews 11, chapter, verse number 8. By faith, Abraham. 
Now you need to understand, his name was Abram, wasn't Abraham at that time. First, before God changed his name in covenant and brought God into his name, which made it Abraham, it was Abram. And he says, by faith, Abraham, his name at that time in the beginning was Abram, obeyed when he was called to go out of the place in which he would receive as an inheritance. Now you read that, you don't think much about it, but he comes from a very wealthy family. All he had to do was hang in there, very famous, very wealthy family, had a lot of tradition, a lot of background, had a lot of prestige, had a lot of power. When Abraham, Abram's family spoke, thousands of people understood what was going on. Very rich, very powerful man. And here's God he's never met. And he comes and he says, I want you to leave where you're at. By the way, when you leave where you're at, that means you're going to lose everything that belongs to you in the future. It's going to go to somebody else in the family who worked it. And he gets up and he just goes. And he went out. And listen to these words. <clears throat> Not knowing where he was going. Just did it. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what's happening. I'm just going to do it. But let me tell you something. Don't do that until you hear the voice of God to do it. A lot of people hear somebody preaching that and they go out and do crazy things. And that's why you've got a bunch of people that are crazy in the body of Christ and do crazy things and give us all a bad reputation. Because they didn't hear from God, they heard from a preacher. But when you hear from God, he tells you to go, then go. But you hear from a preacher and he tells you to go, don't go until you hear from God. Anybody talking right around here or not? See, he heard from God, he got up and left everything and went. Didn't even know where he was going. And oftentimes when you don't understand what's going on and how it's going to work, your faith starts to get weary. But that's what faith's all about. Faith is the substance of things, hope for the evidence of things. Shout it out at me that are not seen. I hate faith. I want to see it. I want to calculate it. I want a logical conclusion. I want to make a decision based on logic. I want to get to where I need to go because that's the way it is. But it doesn't work that way with God. With God, all of a sudden, something different comes in. It's doing and acting because you know it's the will of God to do it. Follow me? And you don't know how it's happening. And Abraham, who's a great man of faith, comes and he follows a God he didn't know, didn't have any idea. This guy was a moon worshiper when God spoke to him. In the land of Ur, worship the moon. God speaks to him and says, man, there's only one God and I'm it. And I want you to follow me and here's what I want you to do. And he says, man, I'll, I'll do what you want me to do. Go takes his whole family and gone. That is an amazing statement. And that's what this is all about. You're going to have stuff where God's going to speak to you to do something, and you're not going to know how it's going to happen. It's just going to happen. But it won't happen overnight, which brings us to number four. We're talking about those things that test our faith. We're talking about the testing of our faith happens. Number four, when time runs out. The pressures come when your timing runs out. And that's when you become double-minded. Have you ever noticed something about God? He says, I want you to do this. And I very seldom have ever met anybody, I don't think anybody, that has said, God wants me to do it for three months. I very seldom ever have anybody ever say that. Because it's really not a timing thing. It's an obedience thing. And when God says to do it, you and I have got to do it. It's that simple. And oftentimes we have a time period. I'm going to try this for a while. I've been vape for a while. If it doesn't happen, you know, I'm, I just, this year alone started two businesses. That's where Debbie's tonight. Debbie's tonight buying products for one of our businesses, uh, a job site products. In Orange County, got stuck in traffic. So she's on I'm just going to finish my job and you just preach the gospel, tell somebody about Jesus. So my mom will. And I, I have a plan, a business plan. And at a certain time, I'm going to do a, 
certain thing and certain things are going to happen by this time and, and this is going to, none of it works. None of it works. When God's involved in it, it's his time. Now I've said this a million times, listen to this. God controls time, time doesn't control God. If time controlled God, then God, listen to this, would be subject to time. God's never subject to anything. Time is subject to God. So God controls the time. But we put a time on everything. If I'm going to believe God for something, why don't you believe God till, until the end? Why is it you only believe God? Well, I'm going to try it for a year. Doesn't, you think he doesn't know that? You think Satan doesn't know that? He's going to and fro, wanting to find out who's weak, wanting to find out who's double-minded, wanting to find out who he can tear to pieces. Because guess what? The edge is down. And so every single one of us that are in here, stop putting a timing thing on, on the things of God. In fact, listen to this. There's an antidote. An added, antidote? Is that the word antidote? There's an antidote to time. Did you know that? I hate it. It's called patience. <laughs> now listen to what the Word of God says. I'll just pop it up. Uh, James, first chapter. Verse number two says, My brother, count it all joy when you fall into various trials or diverse temptations, the old King James says. Knowing that the testing, isn't that what we're talking about? Knowing that the testing of your faith, knowing that the, isn't that what we're talking about tonight? Isn't that what we're talking about, guys? Is anybody here? Isn't that what we're talking about? We're talking about the testing of your faith. You're going to believe God for something. There's going to be tests coming. There's going to be pressures, trials, tribulations coming at you. Make it sound like it's going to be a rough road. It's going to be tough. There's not going to be very much logic. You're not going to know how it's going to work. And time is never going to be on your side. God is on your side. You don't want time on your side. You want God on your side. Somebody ought to give me an amen. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces something I hate, patience. Verse number four. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Why? How is that possible? Because no matter how long it takes, I'm in this for the long run. I'm in this for the long run. I'm going to tell you something, my friends. You hear my words. You hear them clearly. You mark them down. Write it in your Bible. I've said this since I started this church. I'm going to say it. And I'm an old man now. I'm getting to the place. I'm pushing 70 years old. And I want you to hear what I'm going to say to you. Listen to what I'm going to say. I've said this from the beginning. There will be a day coming when people line up for church services to get into the building. Amen. It'll be a day coming that in the courtyard there'll be 2,000 people sitting there watching a big screen and bring their own chairs and sit on the grass because they can't get in the building. Now watch. Because the place is healthy, the place is real, the place is a godly place, the place exalts Jesus. It's not into men worship, it's into the king of glory and it builds people into maturity and this is a healthy place. It can't do anything. Have I seen it in all of my life? No. I am at the end of my life. I still see it in my dreams. I'm not giving up. And I, you may be dropping me in the box. I'll probably sit up in the service and look at the service and say, now the place is full. And, 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 and I'm telling you, this place is going to get full. Now, wait a minute. I didn't say tomorrow. I'd like it to be tomorrow. Next week, I'll even wait until next month. But I'll tell you what, I don't care how long it's going to take, I'm not backing off my faith. And I have a couple of great prayer warriors and prayer pastors and people who believe just like me coming up behind me. So if it isn't in my generation, it'll happen in theirs. It will happen to their church. And the whole thing, lacking nothing. Because you outweighed, you outran, you outlasted what it is you're believing God for. So tonight, there's going to be pressures against your faith. You're a double-minded man, you'll never make it. You're never going to have anything. 
There's going to be all kinds of trials. There's going to be all kinds of things. The road to your success, hear me. The road to your success, hear me. The road to your success is hard. If you back off, you'll never make it. It's without logic. It doesn't make sense. Three, you don't know how. You don't know how. If you think you know how, forget it, throw it out, it won't work. Because God's not going to do it how you think. He's going to do it like he thinks. And number four, the thing that's going to put pressure against your faith and test your faith is timing. Stop putting a timing on something with a determination. I'm staying in this until I get it. Come on, somebody. I want to make sure everybody's all right with God. Here's the deal. You're going to die and go to hell unless you're saved. Why doesn't somebody just tell you that? Why do they just throw smoke and blow water all over you? And why don't we do, why don't we do that? You think that's going to get you to heaven? Here's how to get to heaven. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. Is it logical? No. But it works. No man gets to the Father except by me. You can't get to heaven your way. In your past thinking, you can't get to heaven your mom and dad's way. I don't care if they christened you or baptized you as a baby. You can't get there. That won't get you to heaven. I don't care if you called yourself a Christian all the days of your life. Doesn't make a bit of difference. There's only one way to get to heaven, and that's Jesus' way. And he makes it very clear in John 3rd chapter. I mean, you can study the scripture all you want. There's no way to get around it. Jesus says it like it is and tells you how to get to heaven. He says you must be born again. Most people hate the words born again because Hollywood has made such a goofy thing. Anybody that's born again is an idiot in a movie. And so that's not what he's talking about. Because Jesus said you must be born again, let's talk about what it means. Here's what born again means from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. It means you've given God all of your heart. It means you've given God all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. Always has been, always will be. All or nothing. I'll prove it to you. I'll prove it to you. Last book in the Bible, you've heard of it, book of Revelation. Jesus himself is speaking. He says, and when I come, I better find you hot or cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. You know what he just really said? Here's what he just really said. People that call themselves Christians that are lukewarm, lukewarm are not real Christians at all and they're going to get vomited from the mouth of Jesus. Listen, lukewarm, little in, little out. Lukewarm, little up, little down. Lukewarm, you know, Riding on both sides of the fence. Some of you have been doing that. Lukewarm is you're not against God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Come on, be honest. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And that's lukewarm. And Jesus warns you. And he says, I'm going to come and I'm going to vomit you from my mouth. Because that's the wrong relationship. It's an all or nothing relationship. And tonight, all you have to do is give God all of your heart. You have to give God all of your life. That's all it is. Simple as that. Simple as that. Sometimes people say, well, if I just pray a prayer, can I tell you something? Is there some magical abracadabra formula, listen, that you repeat in Scripture that if you say it the right way, you get to go to heaven? Come on, don't treat God like he's an idiot. And we just say a little abracadabra formula, call it a prayer, and we get to go to heaven. He watches your heart because your life follows your heart to see if you're real. Come on. Your life follows your heart to see if your commitment to him is real. And if you haven't given him all of your heart, you haven't given him, all you do is you know him in your head. You've celebrated Christmas every year. You've celebrated Easter every year. Of course you know who Jesus is. But that won't get you to heaven. No, it won't. You have to give him all of your heart, give him all of your life. And you know why I say you've got to give it to him? Because he's not a thief to rob it from you. It's your heart and life. 
He's not a conniver to make you do it, a manipulator to hit you in the head with a two-by-four and make you do this. No, no. It's your call. It's your decision. I make the choice like he made the choice. He made a choice to come down and go to the cross for you. And you have to make a choice to go to that same cross for him with your life. And that's what this is all about, is giving him all of your life and giving him all of your heart. Because without it, you're not saved. You're just a nice, religious, American person going to church. And there's a defining difference coming in the body of Christ. And you want to be on the Lord's side by giving them all of your heart and giving them all of your life. And somebody needs to love you and respect you and honor you enough to tell you the truth. And tonight, I love you and respect you and honor you enough to tell you the truth. That's the truth. Whether you like it or don't like it, it's still the truth. And you need to give him all of your heart. Tonight, you have a divine appointment with God. God brought you in here not just to hear about Job or hear about the word, but tonight to get started with him the right way by giving him all of your heart and giving him all of your life. You say, Pastor Jim, how do I do that? Let's do it God's way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. In a moment, I'll count three. I'll go like this. Listen to what it sounds like. One, two, three, and I'll go bang. When you hear that sound, bang, your hand goes up. I'll see it. It's that simple. And then you put it right back down. When you raise your hand, what you're saying by the raising of your hand is I don't want Jesus in my head like most Americans. No, no. I want to give him all of my heart and give him all of my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, and denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. He said, if you confess me where? Before men. I'm a man. I'll see it. He says, I'll confess you as mine before my father. Wow, you want to do this. Then you can put it right back down. You say, wait a minute, Pastor. Hold on. Stop. Stop, stop, stop. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. I'll feel funny. Yep, you will be. Get over it. It's better to feel funny and be embarrassed in a safe place like this than to be in hell forever and ever and ever and ever because you care more about what people see instead of what God sees. Today is your day of salvation. I'm going to count to three. Who should raise their hand if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your heart, I'm speaking to you. If you're one of those people that are in here and you've never given him all of your life, come on, you know who you are. I'm speaking to you. If you're one of those people that are not sure, then make sure tonight. Remember, this is a divine appointment. Don't miss this appointment or the rest of life will be no good at all. But tonight is your night. I'm counting to three. I've done my job. Here it is. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Thank you. Twelve. Thank you. Thirteen. Thank you. Back on this far side. I thought I saw some hands back on this side. Anybody else? Thirteen. There's fourteen. Thank you. Where's number 15? 15, you know you need to get your hand up. Get it up. Come on. Stop messing with God. It's you I'm talking to. You're saying to yourself, I wonder if I should. You should. Well, there's 14 wise people. Where are you? Number 15. Where are you? Number 15. Where are you? There you are right there. I see you. God bless you. Number 15. Let's give the Lord a great big praise for 15 wise people. Isn't God good? Here's what I want you to do. All 15 of you, and 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20, you didn't get your hand up, but you know you should have. Get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend, get your stuff. Get in the aisle, meet me right here in front. I want you to get your stuff. I don't want anybody to leave during this period of time. I want you to get your stuff. If you're serious, you raise your hand with God. Bring. If you're sitting with a friend, come on, just say, friend, I'll go with you. If, you, if your children back in the family, if your children raise their hand, you can bring them too, parents. Debbie remembers when she was seven years old walking down the aisle of the church. To this day, she's a preacher all over the gospel, all over the world because of that. I want you to get your stuff, get out of your seat. If you're serious about God, or if you didn't raise your hand, you know you should have, I want you to come meet me right here in front. You come right now. Let's stand and welcome them. You come right now. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on.
God, not every one of you came, but I, I, I did my job, so I love you guys for coming. Put a smile on your face. This is a good thing, not a bad thing. I want to introduce you to a guy named Dr. B, like A, B, C. B, Dr. is a real last name. It's Becker, but we call him Dr. B. And so, guess what? He's really cool. He's going to pray with you. No weird stuff goes on. Only takes a few moments. See him over here waving at you. If you can make a left turn, just follow him right over there. And let's let him pray with you. God bless you. Thank you so much for coming. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.